very warm welcome to Breakfast with Arab and a very special hello to Paul at the back. Lovely to see you again, Paul. My name is Farah and I'm the Marketing and Communications Leader for Buildings London. And so to our speaker this morning, Andy Duncan was born in Basildon and raised in Billericay and is actually our second Breakfast with Arab speaker from Essex. Offered three jobs at leading school, one of which included being an apprentice chef at a Conrad restaurant, and the other one at Arab. Andy thought he may venture into being a chef. Duly dressed in his blue and white checkered trousers, his hat and apron, Andy went to Caglino's at St James's. He was invited to prepare the kitchen staff lunch and was subsequently offered a job. Concurrently, Andy also had applied at Arab and was interviewed by one of our directors. This particular director was so impressed by Andy that he was offered a job as a technical trainee. On his first day at work, Andy was advised that he was to train as a mechanical engineer, which he knew very little about. Of his 12 years here at Arab, he has spent 10 studying. He studied building services, initially at college and then at London South Bank University. His degree is in building services engineering and he subsequently graduated with a master's in BIM and integrated design from Salford University. Initially Andy started his career by creating autocrat drawings. He progressed to leading a team of technicians responsible for creating complex models for projects such as a more Pacific Rothschild Bank and more recently, Exhibition Road Quarter at the V&A. Andy now leads the digital design team who is responsible for BIM development activity for buildings across the UK. He is also responsible for creating Project O, which is a human-like depiction of a building used to articulate the benefits of BIM in an engaging manner. And he's also developed a tool which can be used by the industry that measures the extent that BIM is being used on any given project and more importantly, its impact. Andy is most passionate about using data to enable optimised design outcomes. He cares deeply about using automation and in a way which allows for more time to be creative. I asked Andy if he could revolutionise the industry, what would he do? And his response was, to create a common language understood by all. So without further ado, I'm reasonably happy to introduce the reasonably charming <laughs> Andy Duncan. Thank you. Can you tell it's been difficult preparing this talk? This should be fun. So my name's Andrew, good morning. The Times They Are A-Changing is a song written by Bob Dylan in 1964. Bob Dylan was a long-time hero of a certain Steve Jobs, co-founder of Apple Computers. And Steve Jobs happens to be somewhat a hero of mine. Steve Jobs is a very clever man who, albeit he's a, definitely a very controversial character. Steve was impetuous to the extent that his employees created an award to be given to the person most able to stand up to him that year. And he tormented his first daughter for the majority of her childhood by denying he was her father, in spite of doing a paternity test that proved the opposite to be true. Yet despite these unflattering traits, many of his former colleagues remember their time working with Steve as being an honour, and he is remembered as a pioneer of his time. One of the main reasons that Steve Jobs was remembered so fondly was his ability to make his team achieve what they thought to be impossible. The tool he became infamous for using in order to do this was his reality distortion field. One of the software designers on the original Mac team described it best when he said, in his presence, reality is malleable. He can convince anybody of practically anything. A famous example of this was when his team presented him with the original iPod prototype. His engineers gave him the iPod and he played with it, scrutinised it in his hands, weighed it and promptly rejected it, giving it back to them and telling them it's too big. His team were aghast 
and said to him, we've literally reinvented inventing to create this. It's impossible to make it smaller. With that, Steve got up, walked to the other side of the room and dropped the iPod in an aquarium. As it sank to the bottom, bubbles floated to the top. Steve's response, there's air in there, make it smaller. <laughs> Apple became famous for demonstrating the reduction in thickness and weight of their products throughout the early 2000s to the extent that they became the world's most valuable company in 2011. And this is a, a title they now trade on a regular basis with rivals such as Google. Now you might have guessed that it's somewhat fair to label me as somewhat of an Apple fanboy. Although it's probably also fair to ask at this point, what has all this got to do with BIM? Steve Jobs was able to deploy his reality distortion field to convince his team that they could achieve the impossible. But it's also something that his rivals have used against him and the company that he founded. Many of Apple's competitors refer to the furore of their product announcements as nothing more than Apple using their distortion field on their customers. It could be said that many Apple fans are so desperate to be revolutionized by the next version of the iPhone that they can't look beyond what is seemingly a, a, a evolution rather than a revolution. Unfortunately, I think the UK construction industry is caught in a reality distortion field of its own. Unfortunately, one more befitting of the, the latter description than Steve Jobs' former. We have known about the need for the industry to change since the Egan and Laven reports of the early 90s. And BIM Level 2 was the halo product that was to be the catalyst in order to enable this change. But instead of reaching for the impossible, we are becoming tired of what was sent to revolutionise us. So how did we get to where we are and how do we move forward? The government BIM mandate was announced in great fanfare in 2011. This mandate promised to refine what was at the time quite an ethereal idea into hard and fast requirements that would be mandatory on all government projects over a certain threshold. In order to do this, the government created the BIM task group. That was to report directly to the Cabinet Office. This task group sought the best minds in industry to help it and the BSI to create the suite of documents that cumulatively define what is now Level 2 BIM. BIM Level 2 provides documents for lots of things. What a file should be called, best practices for sharing files, formal statuses for sharing files with others, how to classify different elements within buildings, and, 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 and. In addition to standards for traditional practices, it also introduced new processes, documents that should be used to deliver future projects. AIRs, EIRs, OIRs, MIDPs, TIDPs, BEPs, PIPs, and then you get the point. Everybody understands everything that I've just spoken about, right? You've all seen those on your projects and you all know how to use them. Thought not. I don't mind admitting, as a so-called BIM expert, I still haven't seen many of those documents used on projects, and I don't know, well, I don't think I'd necessarily recognise some of them if they were put in front of me. In wanting to create a robust definition for how we were going to deliver BIM, the government has created a standard so impenetrable that a sub-industry of BIM nerds has emerged in order to serve as translators to the other two and a half million of us that work in construction. In fact, it's so bad that it's become cliché to mention the number of acronym, acronyms that BIM Level 2 has generated, but that doesn't mean it's not a problem. Elon Musk, the guy that wants to take us to Mars, is so anti-acronym he recently sent a memo to his employees. No one can actually remember all these acronyms, and people don't want to seem dumb in meetings, so they just sit there in ignorance. This is particularly tough on new employees. Again, I don't mind admitting but this still happens to me at times when I'm talking about BIM. So how on earth is a client supposed to feel? However, it's no wonder that we're all trying to deliver according to these processes. The government's newish website promises untold riches, 33% cost savings on CapEx and OpEx across the operational life cycle of a building. Certainly not to be sniffed at, but I would argue that these, these figures are very difficult to justify. 
Now I'm conscious that it sounds like I'm trying to build a case for the industry to ignore level two BIM, but I can assure you that I'm not. On the contrary, I'm a firm advocate for following most of the standards to the letter, as they create order where there was previously chaos. But it's my view that we've created blinkers for the industry that have focused our attention on complying with these standards alone, and we're losing sight of the wider benefits. One of the first documents the BSI published on BIM Level 2 contains a definition for BIM itself. Building information modelling. The process of designing, constructing, or operating a building or infrastructure asset using electronic, object-oriented information. What strikes me about this definition is that there's no mention of management. Yet so much of what constitutes Level 2 BIM is about exactly that, management. This is of course necessary, but we all know how painful additional layers of administration are when there are precious few resources to manage in the first instance. So I'd like to strip all these layers of administration away for a moment and return to first principles by focusing on how to leverage additional value from building data. As I've mentioned, the government's website refers to the potential efficiency gains BIM has to offer the industry. It's no surprise we're aiming for big improvements in this area, as it's common knowledge that the construction industry lags far behind at many other sectors in this regard. But comparison between our efforts and the leap forward in manufacturing are particularly stark. Automated assembly plants are now the norm in automotive manufacturing. The levels of productivity achieved by these plants are the consequence of manufacturers continuously forensically analysing their processes. Individual tasks are identified, scrutinised, in order to make them better and reduce the waste material. In addition, the interface between tasks and the inventory allowed to build up between them is also optimised in order to further improve efficiency and quality. However, as is often highlighted, most manufacturers make thousands of the same product whereas as building designers, we mostly create one-off prototypes. So how do we take manufacturing techniques and apply them to building design? I believe the answer lies in the value we place on data and the degree to which we structure it consistently. As an engineer, the raw material we generate value from is data. But the engineering industry is very guilty of holding this data in lots of very small silos. We more commonly refer to them as Excel files. <laughs> However, if we liberate this data from these silos and structure it more consistently, we have the capacity to be every bit as productive as our manufacturing cousins, if not more so. The industry is full of thousands of scenarios whereby information is often duplicated, recreated, or pass between individuals in the form of markups. All this activity is wasteful and can be removed by carefully creating the data available. A few years ago, my team and I set ourselves a challenge to create more meaningful tools that maximise the value of the data available to us. We developed a consistent data standard, which, when expressed in tools like Revit, serves as a platform that facilitates the creation of automation tools. These tools function because they are able to retrieve the data they need when they need it and use it to generate valuable outputs. One such tool is the Automatic Mechanical Suppliers Tool, or AMPS for short. AMPS does what it says on the tin. It automates the creation of power supplies required for mechanical equipment. It is but one example demonstrating how automation algorithms reduce waste activity in order to maximise the value generated in the time available and the potential productivity gains are not insignificant. AMPS reduces the time required to complete a task it was designed to do from days, if not weeks, to seconds. This isn't really addressed by BIM Level 2. This work is a tangible reflection of our Deputy Chairman's desire to reduce the effort required to do the usual in order to provide more time to be creative. Optimising individual tasks certainly has value. But by daisy-chaining tasks together, making the output of one task serve as the input of the next, 
we can exponentially reduce the time required to create a viable engineering design solution. In the future, we should be presenting our clients with a choice of designs, which we've had time to iterate and generate on their behalf, rather than presenting them with a the single time we were created in the time available. Producing thousands of prototypes in a short space of time is the construction industry's equivalent to autonomous manufacturing. But working in this way requires a more rigorous approach to the storage and consumption of data than is normal in the construction industry. However, although many of the processes in building design are common, differences between building types or building systems often dictate that different engineering workflows must be deployed. So for that reason, unlike manufacturing, our processes cannot be linear. We must instead have multiple branches through which the data can flow in order that they can be applied to the, the project to which they're being used in the context of the design to which they're being applied. You get what I mean there. In the future, I believe the engineer's worth will be expressed through the route they choose to travel through the processes available to them as the roles we previously sold our time to complete on behalf of our clients are commoditized by the rise of artificial intelligence and machine learning. But working in this way challenges engineers to change their behavior. Merely being presented with a final engineered outcome is not sufficient for most. Instead, the majority of engineers want to understand how each and every step of the engineering task is being completed, whether this is, a, whether this is required of their role or not. Nevertheless, I believe that we need to change this ingrained culture. But in order to articulate why, I'd like to focus on an example born of another engineering discipline. Modern jets are designed to be aerodynamically unstable in order to facilitate maximum agility. Stability is resistant to change, as our structural colleagues know. The more stable you are, the harder it is to react dynamically. Aerodynamic instability has the reverse effect, but it comes at a cost. The compromise that must be made in order to maximize the performance of the aircraft is that the plane cannot be flown by a human alone. The plane must be operated in tandem with a computer, the job of which is to overcome the plane's inbuilt aerodynamic instability and keep it in the air. The pilot doesn't need to see the code or have the ability to understand it. Instead, they must have faith that it's been written well enough to put their life in the hands of the engineers who wrote it. In science, computing and engineering, a black box is a device, system or object which can be viewed in terms of its inputs or outputs alone, with no knowledge of the internal workings. Most engineers shudder at the mention of the term, and many consider the creation of black boxes to be the antithesis of progress. I'm not sure I agree. I believe that in order to move forward, our industry must embrace working in tandem with machines, letting the machine doing the usual on our behalf. We must embrace tools that give 21st century engineers 21st century agility. The alternative solution is to keep teaching all engineers how to create Excel-based calculators in order that they fully understand all of the calculations that they're, they're conducting from cradle to grave. Indeed, as my colleague Graham highlighted last month, the illiterate of the 21st century will not be those that cannot read and write, it will be those that cannot learn, unlearn, and relearn. Creating an engineering culture that values structured data held in properly curated databases, linked by optimized algorithms, has the potential to enable vast productivity gains, as we've discussed. But I think working this way is also fundamental to changing the way we approach the design process in the future. Structured data unlocks the potential to create optimized processes as I've described, but it also results in data-rich project outputs. As a result, these project databases have the potential to inform further outcomes and to live on, such as serving analytics platforms. How much heating does the building require? How much cooling does it require? How much concrete does it contain? 
and so on. This information is valuable in itself as it provides an opportunity for presenting important project metrics to clients or to internal project stakeholders without Goliath modeling, modeling programs or monster workstations. But the value of the data contained within individual project databases is but the tip of the iceberg when you consider the potential to be gleaned from the ability to compare data across many projects. I'm designing a hospital in this area. Show me other projects within a 150 mile radius that have a floor area of greater than X and a heating load of less than Y. The resulting list of projects is probably what I should be using to inform my next design. It sounds like we should have access to this sort of information now, but we don't. And the reason is the chaotic nature that we currently author our data, not as Arup, but as an industry. The same is true for clients. Show me the building in my portfolio that operated within its desired temperature tolerances last month. And compare that to the, the cost that I'm charging that building out to its occupiers. Today we're beginning to flirt with the possibility of achieving these data-driven outcomes. But these will only become the norm when we place more value in data and curate it more thoughtfully during design, construction, and operation activity. A tsunami of data resulting from the explosive uptake of IoT devices is also set to impact our industry in the next decade, if not sooner. But we need to be storing the data required to give that information context now for it to have any value. The Economist recently published an article stating that the most valuable commodity in the world is no longer oil, but data. The article explains that the most valuable companies in the world are no longer the oil giants, but the owners of our social data, Facebook, our search data, Google, our retail data, Amazon, our travel data, Uber. These companies were able to, to disrupt the industries in which they operate by monetizing the data available and using it to sell back a service superior to their rivals. Who is set to disrupt the construction industry in the same way? BIM Level 2 provides but one view of how to produce and consume data more valuably than we do today. But we must remember to look beyond the confines of COBE, CDEs and BS8541 if we are to make real progress. We must remember to think imaginatively about how we store and use the data available to us. I see a world where data has the potential to influence behavioural change in the design process, how we manage our buildings, and how we empower owners and occupiers. Use the processes and managerial requirements of BIM Level 2 for inspiration, but more fundamentally, remember to ask yourself, what would you like to achieve what data do you need in order to achieve that? And how can you use technology to do that better than you do today? And in doing so, don't limit yourself to what you currently consider to be possible, as Steve Jobs proved over and over again. I'd like to end on a simple quote by Steve. The people who are crazy enough to think they can change the world are the ones that do. Thank you very much. Just, I just about survived that. I think that was okay. <laughs> Any questions? You mentioned a need for a, a common language uh, and for data to be named and stored yes. uh, in a common manner. And then also a need for being experimental and unique and reaching the project's needs. Mm -hmm. Things like Kobe and CDEs were originally developed to um, get rid of the problem, to, to create consistency. And although they're not working in some instances, what would, you say, um, what would you say are other options to keep things in the same language, but also with the ability to, to move and be malleable? Yeah. So without picking on it immediately, Kobe's a good example where if you go back to, to what I was saying at the end, what we need to do is think about 
what data, what, what do we want to achieve, what data is available, and how can we use that to do it better than we do today. Kobe is an example of some data output that we can generate as a consequence of construction or, or design work. I'm yet to find too many people that have worked out how they're going to use it. We've started at the wrong end. We've come up with a data standard that should be pushed out by everybody, and we'll try and work out what we're going to use it to, to do. Whereas actually, we need to look at how we're going to use it, what data needs to be contained within that standard, and thus, what do we need to generate on projects. And I'm, I've, I don't think that Kobe contains anywhere near enough information to inform even design processes, let alone construction and operation processes, because it misses out a whole heap of design information, which means that some of the manufacturing data that it does contain doesn't have any context. So if we've got the rated output of a chiller, we don't have the design connected load of that chiller, so there's no, I've got no idea whether I can put anything else onto that system. And that's what people aren't generating enough value from the data that we, we, we are producing because ultimately they've been looking at it from the wrong direction, I believe. Do you think if the standards are implemented, say, for the architecture schools, engineering schools, m and &E, QSs, and from university, will be get used to produce work to certain standard, understand, and when we graduate, we'll be able to communicate better because as an architect, we struggle sometimes with m and &E when our, my dog, my design is 50 mil or 100 and m and is a meter. Do you think early implementation of these standards in education could be a better outcome? I, th I think the more digitally literate our graduates can be, the better. Be that expressed in understanding data standards or understanding other engineering processes or, or, or tasks that need to be undertaken by the people in the industry. I gave a talk to um, a, a, a class of Imperial um, master's students a couple of months ago, and I challenged them that effectively I think they need to be data scientists as much as they need to be engineers in the future. The value of the data that they're going to generate is going to be too valuable for them to only do engineering. They're going to have to be able to use and consume that data. So I think that that's, I don't know if that answers your question, but I think the more digitally literate we can make our graduates, the better. To misquote George Orwell, yeah. knowledge is power. Sharing of data is a great idea. What do you say to those in the construction industry who say, that if I tell you what I know, then I'm no longer powerful? I, th yeah, I, I think I think it's a it, it's a very valid point. The look at the data giants across the rest of the world, the Googles, the the Facebooks, they don't really share their information with other companies, let alone their their customers. What that has resulted in is they're now very monolithic within the the services that they. Um, the sectors that they operate in. Construction and engineering and design is far less monolithic than that. And that's not me saying I want us to go in that direction, but I think we'll start to see companies that offer more holistic services so that they can join the, the gaps in the data between design, construction and operations and offer a more holistic service. I think going back to why Apple, one of the world's most valuable companies, was successful is because it joined up the marriage of their hardware with their software to give a superior experience. In construction, we don't think in that way. Ultimately, if you do do that sort of thing, you will own a lot more data, and if we can follow the example set by other companies in other sectors, we should be able to do a lot more with it. It would be interesting to explore whether or not we can't, because of the nature of construction, set up some sort of data exchange economy where we can actually buy into data owned by others in order to inform our own processes, because we don't necessarily want to go in that direction. That hasn't been done elsewhere as far as I've seen. Some of my data scientist friends might be able to uh, correct me on that. But I think we, need to, we just need to think differently about data. Right now, I don't, uh, even though we've been talking about BIM for what feels like a very, very long time, 
there's still nowhere near enough people talking about the data that we're using to inform our BIM processes and the outcomes that uh, con come as a consequence of it. Kind of related question. Um, the BIM level two standards, um, I think right at the beginning of PAS 1192, there's a statement about you're producing the same information as you always were. This is just in a more efficient yeah. format. Um, you, you mentioned data economy, and that was kind of my question. Do you, do you think the standards could say something about actually this does have a value as you know architects and engineers we're, we're kind of being told uh, you're you're now producing a model the client should kind of own that there's no additional fee associated mm -hmm. um, you know Google makes their money from data should <coughs> should it be should the conversation more be about actually you can sell your model you you can sell your data um, mm. it does have a value uh, this is a long-winded question but there, there are so many um, you know, exchanges um, between different parties, handovers in, in, the, in the construction process. And it seems like a lot is kind of broken down by contracts and people not being willing to uh, share yeah. information. Um, I'll put my hand up as an architect and, and say, you know, we, we don't want to necessarily let the contractor read, you know, materials or quantities of the model yeah. because we're worried about the, the liability associated with that. So. Um, what's my question here? Uh, <laughs> well, so I'll, I'll jump in. Um, a lot of, uh, the way that a lot of large data companies monetize <laughs> that data is to use it to attract people to a service that becomes so popular that they can then flood it with advertising and sell the advertising revenue because everybody's going there and you're going to see it. I don't think we're going to get to a point where we create buildings that are so popular that people will fight their way through billboards to get to the middle. But what, <laughs> what we do have to do is, and I think that, and it was one of the themes that I was talking about in this talk, to a degree, or I thought about talking about, to a degree I think that BIM's been somewhat missold as a client benefit first. I think the primary beneficiary of BIM is the engineering industry and the construction industry and potentially building operators, but not the ultimate end client who gets the building. We can, as engineers, realize huge efficiency gains from using data more imaginatively with, with complicated software. That gives us time to think more creatively about the buildings we're designing, which ultimately leads to a benefit to our clients. But that doesn't mean that we're gonna save them money in the process or they get 33% savings and I think the thing to remember is BIM is but one client's view, or BIM level two is but one client's view of how to do BIM. It's the government as a client's view of how to do BIM. Private sector buy into it a lot because it's a great big standard and there's lots of BSs in front of <laughs> lots of the documents, but that doesn't mean it's the be all and end all of how it has to be done. And as I said, it's not that I'm ignoring or, st or suggesting you shouldn't do a lot of those things but it's about not being confined to only doing those things. Far too many people are giving up at producing EIRs or B B BIM execution plans and think we've done the job, we've, we've realized the value from data and don't try and do any more with it. And there's so much more value to be had if we think about it more creatively. Go on, Carl. Um, first of all, must say, excellent presentation. Thank, Thank you. you, very thought-provoking. Um, you talked about um, comparative project data. Have you any thoughts about how you could democratise the design and operations data from buildings and infrastructure? Uh, you should speak to my colleague, Mike Trousdale, about that, um, especially in regards to creating a more open data environment around sensor data, BMS data. Um, there's somewhat, I'm not an expert on this, so someone can tell me to shut up if they need to. Um, there are somewhat monopolies in terms of BMS controls uh, that means it's difficult to get at information, it's very costly for clients to buy uh, systems that operate their buildings, but if you use Arduinos to do lots of what that, that would have done in the past, you can surface that data and use it to, to generate valuable outcomes for building occupiers. You know, being able to, if you're looking at a floor plan, being able to see the temperature of every desk and say, oh, I'm going to go sit at that one 
rather than the one that's slightly hotter, which actually suits the person that walked into the building behind me, so they're going to go sit at that one. We, we're used to walking in, into a building and it just being as it is. Um, the, the only other thing I'd add to that is, again, it, it somewhat comes back to the consistency of how we're storing it. It's all well and good to come up with a system. And so a lot of what we've been doing internally has been very, very Revit biased, right? And that's not to say Revit's the only tool, but it's the tool that we use on the, in the majority of in instances. We've created a very rich data standard within that Revit environment that expresses lots of the variables that would otherwise have existed in our spreadsheets. But by doing so, we can do the calculations that used to exist in spreadsheets in Revit models, which, because they're all structured the same way, we can then mine the data from. So we can look across all of our models and ask, what's the heating load, what's the cooling load, what's the electrical power output? We will be able to shortly. We're still working on creating enough projects to actually do that. Um, from that data standard. But by doing so, we have the ability to compare one project to the next, to the next, to the next. And the value of that to us is so massive that I believe we should be giving, we should be looking at how we can't make that data standard available for others in the industry to use. Because it's not about Arup being the best company out there if we're the only company that's consistent. Consistency, you know, it's about the industry being consistent. So if we can help to create a more common data structure, at least around engineering language within Revit as a platform, as a starting point, then that's got to be progress. And then we can use that data standard to sell a superior engineering service. That's what we want to be known for in the first instance. We don't want to be known as the best Revit company under the sun. That's not what it says above the door. So. That I, I think it's about uh, being more collaborative and being willing to share some of that, that information. And hopefully we can, at some point in the future, um, live up to my expectations of the rest of the industry and do that ourselves. Are you, are you talking about sharing or are you talking about selling? <laughs> I would ideally, at least with our sta data standard, not sell it. I think that's about personally, and we, we haven't worked this out yet, but... I think that's about creating a common data standard to create consistency is far more valuable than the time, uh, than the money you'd raise from actually selling it as a service. We can then sell services that build on top of that data standard. And that's where we can monetize stuff. Everybody else can go and do that, but then we're in a, a um, competitive creative economy. Right now, we don't have a data standard to be competitive and creative. We're all throwing information at each other saying ours is better than yours and it's not serving us very well. Good morning. Uh, very important um, and very interesting um, lecture, I thought, because as you can see, data has clearly had a big impact on all other aspects of our life, um, as, as it was mentioned in the speech. Um, and as an architectural practice, um, the question of design and how much time you put on data um, is always kind of up at the top. Um, so I think it was really interesting. Um, what we want to take away is the fact that Actually, the structured element is really useful, um, iterative and learning sort of through the black box kind of thinking approach. I thought that was a really nice um, statement and that I know it's a kind of echo by Arab, but also in, in our practice at David uh, Miller Architect. So um, no, really, really interesting um, and uh, lots to think about, I guess, going forward. I think the, uh, the idea of structured data is very important um, because a bit like a library system or a CD system, if you don't have a structure, then it's very difficult to communicate with other people. Um, so it's a bit like a, another a new language. So in the days of like Google Translate, we should have obviously a, a discipline-wide um, construction industry language, which everyone can actually speak to, um, because otherwise it'll get lost. Um, you get lost in translation. So I think that was probably the most important thing, uh, the sort of common language. I think it's a great principle the fact that data should be shared and should be shared in a way that empowers and allows design to actually offer value and create more than is currently available. BIM is part of the solution, um, but as with all of these things, it's how people would use BIM, how people want to use BIM, and how the value that they see in actually using those tools to actually move construction forward and move the industry forward. The, the principle of sharing of data and commonality of data is a great goal. It's been a goal ever since Henry Ford decided to make cars. 
trying to actually put that into a form that creates environments where people want to share in a non-threatening environment and see the value in that is a real challenge. Um, I think our, our challenge as, a, as an industry is to try and understand how to create that desire within the industry. And that's a, a real challenge and one that all of us need to take away as of today. Ultimately, um, we are required to offer value to our clients and whether those clients are private clients, whether they're government clients, everybody is interested in reduced cost. But reduced cost for its own sake will not actually deliver value. Reduced cost is a way of actually empowering the value of shared data and using that to create a new, bad word, paradigm. don't like the word, but it, it, it creates a new way of thinking for people. I, I actually found it really, really fascinating, just the challenge of what a company can do internally with what it already has. I'm actually slightly outside of the construction industry, but I work on the peripherals. And what I find an awful lot is the, that companies are so geared towards, oh, what does my client want? I must do this, must do this, must do this, must move on. And they don't actually think about what they already own. So the challenge that Andy put forward of, how do we link up what we already know? How do we use the data we already have just to be more efficient in ourselves? Because once we've done that and we've got that platform where we've got a structure, it actually makes it so much easier to start thinking and being creative on top. I've certainly come across that with a lot of design industry specialists where they're, they're so initially focused on all oh, oh, frameworks and, and, and structure is a naughty word, it's a bad thing, process is terrible, it stops us being creative. But actually it's the release mechanism to be creative. And I think that really chimes with some of the comments that Andy was making about use the data, make the structure, 